Hi, everyone. We are going live. Coach Jen and I are here, and you know the drill. We want to know that we have succeeded in the internet world, that we are live, and I'm going to go live on Instagram as well. So hold on. Here we go live on Instagram as well. And let us know that we have achieved success. If you see us there, say hello. Everybody's spinning, so we don't know whether we're live yet or not. Yet. I can see seven people on this. That okay, are watching, so. perfect. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Teresa. Good to see you. Hi. Karen's going to be hosting for us today. So thank you so much. And Coach Jen is here. Today we are talking about how to flourish independently. Remember yesterday, if you were here on our live, we talked about this chart. We talked about this internal external. And we're going to be doing, today we practice, today we're going to be doing a workshop. Next Tuesday, we're going to be doing a workshop. I'm not okay when you're not okay. How many of you can relate when something happens in your external world, you are not okay. Welcome everybody from Instagram. So glad you're here. We're talking about how do you flourish on the inside when the outside of your life is falling apart? You just got diagnosed with cancer. You just found out your husband's cheating. I'm not saying you flourish right in the moment. You grieve and you pound your fists a little for sure. That's, that's true. But, but so often when someone's not okay, they're still into porn, they're still doing what they're doing. Your kid is making mistakes and you just are a nervous wreck. You're grieving, you're anxious, you're frustrated. You want to try to change them. You want to try to control them. And so today we want to talk about how do you deal with that? How do you move beyond that? Welcome everybody from Instagram. I see you. I see you. Thank you. And I see you here. A lot of you are saying you've got rainy weather. I am in Phoenix, Arizona. And guess what? We have rainy weather too. It's been raining all day, freezing cold. I'm wearing my sweater. I hardly ever get to wear this sweater, but I put it on today because I was so cold. So welcome. Welcome. So I invited Jen, Coach Jen, to talk a little bit about this because she's living this experience right now. Um, and I think this is really important because our webinar next Tuesday, if you haven't signed up for it, we have over 2000 women signed up already. And we hope to have as many as possible because this is such an important topic of I'm not OK when you're not OK. And so what I do to try to fix myself is I try to make you OK, like you've got porn problems and I'm not OK with that. So I'm going to nag you to death to fix your porn problems, which, of course, you're not going to do. And so I'm never going to be OK because you don't change. And this is the terrible cycle Christian women get into in trying to fix the person who's not doing what you want them to do or not doing what you think that God wants them to do in order for you to be able to be okay. What is the option to that? And so we're going to discuss all of the details of that in our webinar next Tuesday. And if you haven't signed up yet, you can sign up by going to our site at lesliebernick.com forward slash join webinar lesliebernick.com forward slash join webinar. But today we're going to talk about just one piece of that, just one piece of when they're not okay or we're not okay as a couple or as a parent, adult child, or maybe you're the adult child and your parent isn't okay and you're feeling all out of sorts and the relationship isn't the way you want it to be. And you can't fix the relationship because you have no power to control or fix the other person. How can you flourish? How can you be okay? So Jen, if you would be willing to share some of your story, mm -hmm. I think it'd be really helpful. So Jen's been on our team for, for a couple of years now, and she had a crisis in December. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to put it, let you take over and share your Thank story. You. Yeah, thanks. It was actually October, November really is when it hit, when I got to see you. So yeah, for those that already know a bit of my story, um, my husband and I have been in recovery from betrayal trauma, um, his betrayal dating back, I found out about 13, 12, 13 years ago. And so we bumped along the way, found the Lord together. I mean, we were both Christian before, but not as active as we've been over this past decade. And um, kind of, you know, he'd peak with his recovery and then kind of slide off and then my trauma would act up again and then he wouldn't be happy with that. And so for the most part, I would say we were successful until we weren't. And I think as time went on, I, I kind of just saw the writing on the wall. I saw him becoming complacent. My trauma was activated, you know, for one last time where it just you know, not always my best self, um, that kind of thing, and just health problems and things like that. So um, we kind of took a break from each other. And I got a text one day that he was he found a place and was moving out. So I have to say as devastating as that was, it was also a bit of a relief. I had already put plans in place. So according to like our topic today, flourishing, 
I already knew I could feel God prompting me, not so much that it would be over because I know he doesn't always want that, but I also think he wants both of us to thrive. And I wasn't really thriving anymore. Um, and so I think with that idea of flourishing, like that's how I introduced myself to pickleball, for example, which I love and uh, all different activities that he kind of tapped into with me, my husband, which was great, but it was me trying to assert myself into my own independence, not to get away from him. Just, I wanted to do my own thing. And if I can put in a plug for my mom for a second, Leslie, is that okay? Sure. When I don't know your mom, about, but I'm plugging for her. Moms are great. Yeah. So yeah. So when like when we think about flourishing independently, I think of my mom. Um, my dad passed away from COVID a couple of years ago, but long prior to that, um, he would suffer on and off from depression and, and anxiety. And so for years, my mom would do things on her own. She didn't let that stop him. She loved him dearly. They were just an awesome married couple. But she would go out and still play cards with the ladies and do yoga and curl and all kinds of activities, go on little weekend trips and shopping and all kinds of stuff. And as much as we miss my dad, I was so impressed with my mom to see her still. She had that foundation in place. And that's one thing to help you flourish when you want to gain that independence or as you're struggling in a different relationship is to have those outside connections. And she really did so that as much as she missed him and she was so sad when he passed and it was very tragic, she was okay in the sense that she, when she was ready, she just picked right up in those activities again. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, my husband and I spend so much time together and we are in many ways like best friends that I thought, yikes, I'm not doing stuff on my own. What would I do if anything happened to him? Well, it happened to us. And luckily I was already starting to do some of those activities. So now I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a choir. I'm, I've got my life group again from church. I volunteer. I joined the senior center. I'm back into pickleball. I'm doing line dancing <laughs> and I've got lots of friends that are just surrounding themselves um, with me. So, you know, that's, that's what it is. It took a lot of self-awareness, a lot of courage on both of our parts, I want to give him credit. I think one of us had to finally have some solid boundaries in place and we get along great. We're like I said, we're really great friends and just maybe not meant to be helpmates anymore because I don't think we were doing that for each other. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> There's always more I could say, but you know, we want to focus on our audience as well. So, so part of what Jen is saying is that, you know, through these 10 years of betrayal trauma and her doing her work and hopefully him doing his work, they each started to get healthier, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, you're, if your husband's unhealthy and you're frantically over-functioning trying to get him to change, you're a bit unhealthy too. It's not your fault that he's acting out. It's not your responsibility to fix his problem. But when you've lost yourself in another person, then that's a bit unhealthy for you too. And we talked about that yesterday in Facebook Live, that how do we anchor ourselves in God? How do we become God-centered women, not self-centered women? So I think this is what the world teaches us. Oh, it's all about me and I have to find myself and do myself. God calls us to be God-centered women, but being God-centered women doesn't erase ourself. We talked about this yesterday. This is so, so important, ladies, because we have been taught as Christians, we want, to, if you're following me, you want to be a Christian. You have those values. But I think being as old as I am, and some of you who are following me are as old as I am, or go to a very conservative church like I did, and still do. I go to a pretty conservative church. Right? And I think the teaching used to be that dying to self meant you don't have a self. That any time you talk like Jen's talking about having friends and flourishing and thinking about what you want, oh my gosh, that's so self-centered. How could you even want that? You know, that's not godly. And I think we have to be really careful. Yesterday we talked about what does dying to self mean? Because dying to self does not mean annihilation, which is sort of how as women, men haven't been taught the same thing about that, but as women, it's like, oh, you just need to die to yourself. Quit complaining about your marriage. Quit wanting to try to change him. Just, just serve and love and give and give and give and give and don't look out for your own interest. And that's not what the Bible teaches, actually. It says in Philippians, don't merely look out for our own interest. So yes, we will look out for our own interest. We should look out for our own interest, but God is cautioning us not to be selfish. But we don't go to the opposite and have not, 
thing to do with our own interests. So what does dying to self mean? What do you think based on what we talked about yesterday? If you were here yesterday, what did you get out of that conversation? What does dying to self look like in light of this flourishing conversation? Mm -hmm. So yesterday we talked about like how to grip onto God and hang on to God when things are going sideways in your life. But how do you flourish when maybe the desires of your heart are unmet? You didn't get that restoration of marriage like Jen didn't get or you don't get that pregnancy that you wanted, or your adult child doesn't want to hang out with you and doesn't want your presence at Christmas, and you get hurt. Of course you do. And you know everything that you dreamed of that your life would look like is not looking like that. What do you do? What do you do? What does dying to self look like? Amanda says, thank you for teaching us the definition, <clears throat> but what does it look like? What do you remember from what I said? Because I don't want to just repeat myself. I want you to teach one another. What did you get? It affirms myself regularly because what God says about me is life-giving. Okay. Yeah. Being a God-centered woman doesn't erase our sense of self. Yeah. Being a God-centered woman does not erase herself. Okay. You said that twice. Wonderful. I flourish because I have Jesus. Yes. And God calls us to flourish. When he says, I have come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly, what does that mean in light of dying to self, right? And I think this is where it gets dicey. And this is where if you are listening to me, one of the things I encourage you to do is think for yourself. Lots of people will have opinions. I just talked to my sister this afternoon. She called me. I'm in, my husband's having a big birthday this weekend. So I'm in Michael's trying to get some stuff for, for a party for him. And she's calling me and she says, I just got this out of the church library. Do you think this is true? And then she read me a passage of, you know, something from old school teaching. And I said, actually not. I don't think it's true. She goes, I went to the pastor's wife and I asked her, she goes, why is this book in the library? I can't believe this is true. And the pastor's wife said, well, I think it's true. And so People are going to have different opinions mm -hmm. on what God really says. And this is imperative, women. If you're going to flourish at all in any way, as a Christian, as a woman, as a human being, guess what you have to use? The mind God gave you. The mind God gave you. Just because someone says it doesn't make it true, including me. Including me, right? So just because someone says it, it might tickle your ears run it through scripture. And this is where it's crucial that you know scripture, because sometimes people can use a Bible verse, like in Malachi, God hates divorce. That verse has been misused and weaponized. And it doesn't even say that. It doesn't say that in the original languages. King James was the first translator who translated it that way. And it's been mistranslated ever since. And now they're starting to reverse that. The NIV came out with a new translation. It doesn't read it that way. But how many of you have been taught that? And it's been used as a weapon to keep you afraid and stuck in a toxic situation that God would rather you die in your marriage than for you to be divorced. I was in the Philippines, Jen, when um, one of the first mission trips I ever took, and I was counseling missionaries there. I was a safe counselor because I wasn't going home. And if you were counseling with a missionary who stayed there, they knew your story and you were in the same community. So they could tell me anything. And I remember a pastor's wife from the mission field said to me, she goes, I'm suicidal and I think I'm going to do it because I think it'd be more honorable to die than to divorce. Her husband was abusive and she couldn't imagine telling the truth. She couldn't imagine that her ministry and all the leaders and everybody would know. And I said, I think they sort of know already, but from what you're telling me and the way he treats people and they all knew, but nobody was willing to confront him. He was a bully minister as some of them are and people are scared of that. But dying to self doesn't mean you don't have a self. Dying to self, Jesus uses the illustration of a seed. Remember we talked about that yesterday? And when a seed goes into the ground and dies as itself to a seed, it's no longer a seed. That's right. When a caterpillar dies to itself, it's no longer a caterpillar. It dies to itself. But it doesn't become nothing. It dies to itself to grow into maturity, mm -hmm. to flourish, to become what God designed in that little seed for it to become what it designed in that little caterpillar for it to become a butterfly. And God wants you to die to your immaturity in order for you to become so that you can flourish, not in a self-centered way, but in a mature way. It is God's will for you to mature. Romans 12 tells us that very clearly and other places in the scripture. So don't let someone rob you and keep you infantilized like a baby, like you don't have a voice, you don't have a choice. You can't speak up for yourself. You can't think for yourself. 
because somehow that's a godly woman? Absolutely, that's a baby. That's a baby. And babies are wonderful as babies. But when adults act like babies, it's sad. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, you know, something I just heard in the similar vein of when we were talking about how some women feel like dying to, to themselves or, or dying to self and, and all that might come with it and those limiting beliefs we have about it being selfish. Well, I've heard soulfish recently as a play on words where it's, we're, we're being so full and they've changed it from selfish to soulfish. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we want to look at what fills our soul mm -hmm. in order to flourish, right? In, in Jesus name and what God's called us to be, mm -hmm. which is like, it, you know, and like going back to my situation, like I'm actually, I'm not sad anymore. This is good. I've reconnected with God in a whole different way. And I feel like I have his blessing. I really do. I really do. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and when you talk about, you know, all of those, those things that we can do it, to me, it also means that and the way I look at it is if I can free up stress, heartache, the enemy, however, he's got me wrapped up. If I can free up just even a little bit of that, it just creates more space for God. It's, you know, like you're only one cup full, right? And if a lot of it's filled up with the enemy and I'm bound by something and angst and anxiety and all that kind of pressure and stress, there's only this much left for God. But if I can displace some of that and get rid of it through healthy activities and love of God and scripture and everything else, then now the enemy's only got maybe this much and the rest of my cup is filled with the Lord. That's the way I look at it. So whatever little activities I can do or connections with others or diving into the word, it, to me, it's all godly in that sense that I'm making more space for him. That's how you flourish, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we use our analogy of a seed dying to itself as a seed, what does it need to flourish? Mm -hmm. It needs water. It needs sunshine. It needs nutrients. Right? Is that plant being selfish because it's taking nutrients from the soil and enjoying what God provides in sunshine and rain? Or is it doing what it's supposed to do to steward its existence so that it can bear fruit for God's glory, whether it's a beautiful sunflower and make sunflower seeds that we can chew on, or whether it becomes an apple tree or just a beautiful rose that we can smell and enjoy that scent in our spirit. I mean, is it, so, so what do you need to flourish? And are you giving yourself that? Or are you allowing people to be shade over you, to deny you your water, to tell you you're selfish for nourishing yourself. Jen said, hey, I'm discovering some things that nourish me. Like for me, one of the things that you guys, if you've hung out with me for a while, you know that art nourishes me. I don't sell any of my paintings. I give them away, but I love to paint, right? I love to create a woman's emotional expression on her face and paint, whether it's an old woman or a young woman or a sad woman or a joyful woman. I love to do that. And I'm learning. I'm not great at it, but I'm learning, right? But I love to do that. And it nourishes me. What are pickleball nourishes me. I walk every day. It nourishes me. And if I didn't do those things like today, it's a gloomy day. I didn't get a chance to walk. It was raining all day. I can feel that. Mm -hmm. I can feel that sense of I don't know, depression or, you know, not clinical depression, but just that kind of gloomy, down, energetic feeling. And I don't want to feed that. I have it sometimes, but I know what I can do to nourish something else in my life. Is that wrong to know that? Is that selfish to do that? Or is that good stewardship? What do you think? Mm hmm and I love when you said you talked about the sunflower and, it, and how it's not selfish to take on what we need. And that when someone is like shadowing over us, I know that's when boundaries come in and look at a sound sunflower. It turns throughout the day to face the sun. It knows what it needs and it goes after mm -hmm. it. It doesn't let the clouds and the, the it doesn't stay just in one place. 
Mm. And that's what we need to do, whether it's, you know, through healthy boundaries or moving on or detaching with love, any of those things that allow us to, to flourish and be exactly who God called us to be. Mm-hmm. And I love when you've used the flower analogies before too, Leslie, I always love that we don't have to look the same. So my story isn't the same as Leslie's, isn't the same as some of you out there listening right now. And that's good. That's okay. Mm-hmm. God made us different for a reason. Just like you've often said, a sunflower isn't a rose, isn't a petunia, but they're all beautiful, right? And not everyone likes roses or the smell of them, or sometimes they... You know, like I love dandelions now. I have a full appreciation because we keep bees and they love the dandelions. Who knew? I used to pluck them out of my yard all the time, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's all in perception and it's all different for each of us. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong way to flourish. I think the Lord just wants you to flourish, period. Just flourish. So our workshop next week, I'm not okay when he's not okay. So when someone else is doing things that keep themselves from flourishing, maybe they're doing some self-indulgence as self-care. They're drinking too much. They're watching porn as a means of soothing their own pain. Instead of, instead of self-care, that's really good stewardship, they're doing something called self-indulgence in sinful things that feel good in the moment but have a price to pay. So you're so busy trying to get them to stop doing that. If your husband's a diabetic and he's overeating, and you know it's bad for him, and he knows it's bad for him. How much control do you have over him not eating Doritos and drinking beer at night if he chooses to do that? How much control do you have over that? Put it in the chat. How much control do you have when you see him doing something you know is bad for him, but he's doing it to comfort himself or enjoy himself or whatever? And I'm just picking Doritos and beer. I'm not picking porn or I'm not picking a, something we would label as sinful. He's just doing something we all know, staying up too late, not getting enough sleep. And he's diabetic. How much control do you have to change the way he stewards his self? control, 0% control, 100%. How much control do you have? All right, Camille says none. It's zero, none, zero, zero, none, zero, 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 zero control. Okay, I hope we're all on the same page there. So why, when you notice he's doing stuff that is bad for him and it's bad for you, because let's just be real. If he's a diabetic and he's not taking good care of himself, he's probably gonna have a shorter lifespan. And even if you love him dearly and you're not in a destructive marriage, you're getting nervous because all of a sudden you're going to be the sole breadwinner and all of those kind of things. He's going to lose his legs and you're going to to take care of him. All kinds of stuff that can happen to someone who's a diabetic and not taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. You have zero control over that. We're going to talk about how to define what's his problem. He's a diabetic. He's not taking care of his problem, but what's your problem with his problem? I might be a widow. You can take care of your problem. I better get educated or I better get skills so I can support myself of him. Taking care of his problem when he's not willing for you to support or help him take care of his problem is a waste of your time. But what this is what we do. I'm not okay. I got to try to nag him and beg him and create dinners for him and do everything so he won't watch porn or he will you do what you can't control someone else's problem. Judas had a problem with greed. Mm-hmm. and unbelief. And when he decided to betray Jesus, Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do. He didn't beg him to stop. He said, Judas, I know what you're about to do. Think about it. Do you really want to do that? Judas said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And Jesus let him do it. He didn't go chasing after him. So this is really important, ladies. We can love someone dearly. You can love your adult child. You can love your adult parent. You can love your husband and still be powerless over the choices they make with their life. And then you're not okay. You're not okay, I'm not okay. My kids have made some choices that I wasn't okay with, right? And so then how do you deal with your not okayness? We try to fix them. So we can go, okay, now I don't have to worry about that. But we just said in the chat, you have zero power to fix him. That's why you need to know how to take care of you. And that's what we'll talk about in the workshop. But the one section we're going to talk about right now is how do you feed yourself? Mm-hmm. How do you flourish? If he's not willing to eat healthy, how do you get healthy so that you don't die and languish if he's going to languish? Yeah. I'm seeing some things in the chat that might have passed us by already. I think I saw someone's just finishing up her degree. 
this spring. Mm -hmm. So there's educational components, personal growth, whether it's a class, like I said, I joined the senior center and they've got a book this thick of all the things you can do there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's just any personal growth or it could be more formal education. I mean, we're, I don't think we're ever too old to go back and try a different mm -hmm. career or have God reveal to us a different purpose. I talked to a client today that at first thought she was too old and she always dreamt of being a counselor. And I said, what's stopping you? And she really couldn't come up with reasons, but she had had it so into her head that it wasn't her thing. And you could just see her light right up and sit up straighter. And she was like, wow, not that she's going to run out and do it, but just this, just having a shift in the fact that it's a possibility really lit her up. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see God just like beaming. And then we reflect his beaming on us. <laughs> yeah. Cindy said, it's so sad to me when a woman heals and gets healthy and grows, her husband is no longer appreciative of her new place. It seems to be happening a lot in Christian circles. I think you're absolutely right, Cindy. And I feel bad because I don't, I, I think Christian women have been mistaught, but I also think Christian men have been mistaught. And I think there's a lot of toxic masculinity out there um, and wrong teaching for men. Um, and they, we have a lot of immature men and some immature women as well in different ways. But I think as women get healthy, yes, it does threaten an unhealthy person when you're not willing to dance in that same unhealthy dynamic. Because when you're unhealthy and they're unhealthy, you might not be unhealthy in the same ways. They might be obviously unhealthy and selfish and narcissistic and destructive. And you might be not so obviously unhealthy because again, as we've been taught as Christians, a virtue, sacrifice, suffer, turn the other cheek, have no boundaries, go the extra mile. And without some context around that, that can be just as unhealthy. That can be just as unhealthy. I said something yesterday that really shocked some people awake. When you're a victim of someone's behavior, bad behavior, it's not your fault at all. It's not your fault at all. Victims are victims. And we're all victims sometimes. I've been a victim. I'm sure many of you have been a victim of a parent who was abusive, a husband who was deceitful, or whatever it was. But when you're a repeat victim of the same kind of thing, especially with the same person, you have to ask yourself, what's my part? Like, where's my no? Where's my boundaries? Where's my self-stewardship? Where's me taking responsibility to take care of my safety and my well-being? Because I have put my well-being in someone's hands who misuses that. Mm -hmm. And marriage is meant to be the safest relationship there is. And if that's not true for you, then it's your responsibility to say, wow, what do I need to do to steward my safety and my sanity and our children's? Because this isn't safe. This isn't a safe place mm -hmm. to grow up healthy. And if I can build on that too, I just, I want to encourage those that are listening or are really resonating with Leslie's words, especially around the safety. Sometimes it can feel very daunting to take whatever steps you've got playing in your head. Oh, I should do this or this. I know this woman and she did that. And, and I want to just encourage you that you don't have to even get that far just yet because self-awareness, even just being, you know, courageously committed to your truth in your own head is the step in the right direction. I often liken the awakening or the awareness phase as oh, kind of like painting a room. You know how a lot of what you do goes into the prep and you have to tape off everything. I just want to get to painting, right? I want to see the color change. But as I've learned after all these years, um, it takes time to prep and do it right. To me, that's what the awareness is. Awareness is the bulk of what you do, even if it doesn't physically look like you're taking a step to do something or act what you think is an active step, sometimes just being brave enough to think about it. Your husband doesn't necessarily know yet. No one around you even knows yet. You're playing it up here and in here and with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to just give encouragement to those that are just starting to really come awakened to what their situation is. That's okay. We're all in different places and we all need to do different things. Yeah. And we're so happy you joined us on Instagram. And again, if you would love to ask a question, uh, if you're on Instagram and you want to type it in, Jen, do you have that right in front of you where they can, uh, uh, I have it. Okay. So, yeah. Just type in leslievernick.com forward slash question. And if you want to type in a question, that'll go to our tech team and then they'll give it to me on my computer because it won't be in the Facebook feed. And if you want to ask a private question, not on the Facebook feed, then just 
uh, type it into lesliebernick.com forward slash question, and then it'll go to our uh, tech person who will feed it to me. But Bev said something interesting. So I'd like to have a conversation with you, Bev, on Facebook. She said, my nourishment is to quilt, but he makes me feel guilty for doing it or tries to fill my time so I can't get to it. I try and keep house nice, clean, tidy, but he will then ask me to do something he's doing using the excuse of doing things together. So I would say, yes, you are right that he's uh, uncomfortable with you being independent and doing your own thing for nourishment. But who's responsible for your nourishment? You are. And so it's really important for you to develop your voice. And we'll teach you how to do this in the workshop mm -hmm. next Tuesday. So please sign up. It's absolutely free. Somebody asked in the chat, how much does it cost? Cost nothing. I will give you an hour. My coaches will also be there. They'll give you an hour of our time in teaching you these tools. You'll have a workbook that you can keep that fills in the blanks that tells you what to do so that you can do this. So Bev, I would say two things. You're giving him the power to control your time through the guilt trip. All right. So if, if nobody can make you feel guilty without your permission. So if you said to me, Bev or anybody else on Facebook live, you know, I wish you would have spent two hours on Facebook, or I wish you would have only spent 20 minutes. On, you know, you can think what you think. I'm going to give what I can give, and I'm not going to give what I can't give. And I'm not going to feel guilty if that disappoints somebody. But you're letting your husband say, you need to give me whatever I want from you, whenever I want it from you, or you're bad. And you're believing that, right? So this is where your work comes in and saying, he can think what he thinks. I can't control what he thinks, but I can say, hey, I'm going to quilt on Tuesday and Thursday nights. And unless you're having a heart attack or there's a real emergency, that's what I'm going to do. I play pickleball three nights a week, Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night. And I say to my husband, I'm gone from 6 to 8.30, <laughs> three days a week. This is what I need to do for me. And I'll see you when I get home. And if there was an emergency or we had a funeral to go to or something else, I would do that. Right. But I wouldn't just stay home because he's not happy with me going to play pickleball. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think these are the things that you need to <clears throat> begin to say, I need this. And that gives you some information. So if you said, if your husband said, well, I don't really want you taking vitamins. I don't take vitamins. Why do you need to take vitamins? And you were saying, oh, I feel guilty now. I'm spending money. I'm spending $20 a month on vitamins. My husband doesn't want me to spend money. on." No, if you have the money to spend on vitamins, <clears throat> if he's spending money on his stuff, you can say, you are totally free not to take vitamins, but I want vitamins for my body. And I'm going to take vitamins for my body, or I'm going to exercise, or I'm going to go to sleep for eight hours of sleep. If you don't want to do that, that's up to you. And you don't need to feel guilty because you're not living your life or stewarding your body the way he wants you to, right? You can steward, you get to decide that you're in a grown up. Just because you're a wife doesn't mean you're a child. You get to decide that. That's called agency. God has given all human beings agency and even children want agency as they start to mature. They start saying, mommy, no, I can do it myself. Leave me alone. I'll figure it out. I want to figure out what clothes to wear. Don't pick my clothes out anymore, right? They want choice. And part of a good parent gives their child choice as appropriate for their age. And so when husbands try to take away your choice and you feel guilty for having a choice, he's unhealthily controlling you and you're unhealthily letting him. And I'll say there's some false Christian teaching about headship and submission that sort of creates that misunderstanding on both ends. Yeah, it does. And, and just like we said earlier, we can't control them. You all answered, no, I have no control, none, zero. Really, he has no control over you. It's just been made to feel that way. So we are sensitive to the fact that some of you have been dealing with this for 30, 40, 50 years. It's become just a part of your dynamic. But we're here to you know, love on you and provide support and some education and some tools to be able to kind of lift and rise above that fog that maybe you've been under for quite a few decades even. Right. That false sense mm -hmm. of guilt and mm -hmm. he's got control over me or mm -hmm. that sense of submission or being a good Christian wife, all of those things. And, it, you know, we're not trying to take away your beliefs from you. We just want you to examine them. Mm -hmm. Just really think about what's best for you to flourish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it's best for you to flourish, 
And again, you have to know what resources you have. So if you've got 12 kids, you know, you might not be able to get eight hours of sleep a night, right? Because you have made other choices and that includes taking care of their needs, right? But, but for you to constantly be the giver and for him to constantly be the taker is not healthy, not only not for you, not for him either not for him either. And when we do that as a good Christian wife, we're actually enabling him to be more selfish, which isn't good for him either, right? Mm -hmm. And so think about this. If you're really wanting the best version of your husband to mature as well, coddling, just like coddling a child and doing for the child what the child should be doing for themselves or letting the child get away with a temper tantrum and you giving in isn't helping that child mature right? But we do it to our husbands. We do for them what they should be doing for themselves. And we coddle their temper tantrums and give into them. And they can continue to throw them and they work. But is it really good for them? And is it good for the marriage? No. So if you're a helpmate and seeking to bring about your husband's highest good, is it really good to go buy his alcohol if he's an alcoholic? No. Is it really good to give him money for cocaine if he's an addict? No. So why would it be good to stay silent and enable his selfishness if that's hurting the marriage? It's not good. It's not good for you or for him. But we do it because we don't want to rock the boat and because he's not okay, we're not okay. And so we give in. So we're going to talk about that next Tuesday. But let's get to some questions because there's some questions yeah. on the page. And I know that we want to be done in about 15 more minutes. So let's take some questions. Um, I've been married for 34 years, found out that my husband was lying to me for one and a half years straight about drinking, even though I asked and confronted him numerous times. I told him that he sounded like he was drinking, but if not, there was something really wrong with him. This happened three to four days a week. I finally had to investigate on my own and found out that he was hiding alcohol and drinking. After a confrontation, he finally came clean and promised to never lie to me again promised he would stop the excessive drinking and that he would give me every seat so I could know exactly what he was buying. He also apologized and said the drinking got out of hand. He realized he was drinking too much. I stayed with him another year because of his promises, found out he was not able to stick to those promises and he continued to lie and deceive. We've been separated for one and a half years. During this one and a half years, in my opinion, he has not done anything to get back into the house except tell me he wants to be married and he only wants me and that he's not drinking as much as he was. We've not been able to have many personal relational conversations because he refuses to have them. We do have them, we end up fighting, and I end up being blamed. A little more background on us. We've been in numerous counselors throughout the years during our fighting, lack of communication, lack of respect, his lack of taking responsibilities for his actions. Needless to say, I've been devastated. I've been in counseling for the last eight months. My question is, what do I do? I was raised that you never give up on your marriage and the divorce is not an option. So I am having a really hard time with that option and making any kind of decision moving forward. The problem is I still don't trust him and can't move past that. He has given me a reason to believe that he's still drinking ex to excess on occasion, even though he says he's not. We have two grown boys and I'm trying everything to keep our family together. I don't want to stay separated forever. And I've told him that. Thank you. So we're not here to tell you what to do. Mm -mm. Uh, we're here to tell you, why don't you think about that belief that I can't get divorced? Like there's this belief that somehow what? That means I'm a failure. That means I've dishonored God. That means I haven't kept my marriage vows. So there's some underlying beliefs that you have. And I'm not advocating divorce. I'm still married. And I've been married a long time. And some years have been better than others. But, but, but what I do have in my marriage that is essential that you don't have is I have safety and trust. And those are the two ingredients that God wants all marriages to have. You may, in, in patriarchal days, marriages were arranged. So you didn't have this love romantic kind of thing, but God created marriage. Why do you think he says don't have sex until you're married? Because he wants you to be intimate in a safe, trusting relationship where you are secure and free from harm, right? So in this marriage that you've had, you don't have that. And your husband hasn't shown you that he is trustworthy. So I would say that with a, with a relationship, whatever relationship it is, whether it's a parent-child relationship or a, a boss and pastor, parishioner, husband, wife, when trust and safety have been broken down and they're not repaired, your husband's not willing to repair them. He's not willing to have conversations. He's not willing to be accountable. He's not willing. He's lying, mm -hmm. right? You can't trust him. It's not possible 
to put back. I mean, you can stay legally married. You certainly can do that. But it's not possible to put together a close and safe relationship when there's no trust. That's right. Because I often talk about it as a like a foundation, like building a house. And I don't know, depending on, I guess, where you live, but here in Canada, we have basements, right? So you dig into the ground and you have cement. That that is what holds up the rest of your house with some steel beams and some, some cinder blocks and cement. And that's the honesty part, the transparency and honesty. And then from there, you start to feel safe and that takes work. And then it's only when you have the honesty and the safety that you get to the trust, like Leslie's talking about, all of those things combine then you get to being vulnerable with each other in a loving treasured way that God wanted. And ultimately at the top, the roof on that house to me is then that, that emotional intimacy and even physical, it's that connection that God designed us to have in a beautiful marriage, but you can't just jump into the intimacy. It doesn't feel real. If you don't have all those foundational pieces underneath and the walls and the studs and the next floor and the stairs to get you up there, that's what it takes. There is a bit of a method to this madness, if you will, and it's all God designed. It really is. And same can go for you. You can flourish if you kind of think of the same way. Are you honest with yourself? If you created your own self a sense of safety, can you trust how you're going to show up and respond versus react? You know, are you vulnerable and connected with other people? And then that takes you to your ideal self. That's where you flourish with God's grace. Yeah, Jenny is asking a question. When there are decades of destroyed trust, could it ever be close and safe? if there is no change in one person. I'm just gonna give you the short answer, no, no. You can love someone and you can love them deeply and still not trust them. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't trust people, it says in John chapter two. He didn't trust certain people because he knew it was in their heart. So if Jesus loved everyone, but he didn't trust everyone, I don't think he's asking us that we have to trust everyone. In fact, Proverbs 25 says, Putting your trust or confidence in an untrustworthy person is like walking on a broken foot. It's not smart. You're going to hurt yourself doing that. And so I think that God has given us certain parameters of what makes a relationship work. And if I can't trust, like in Proverbs 31, it says he trusts her or she trusts him about the Proverbs 31 man and woman in, the, in this marriage. He trusts her to do him good, not harm all the days of his life. And so I think one of the things that we don't accept in Christian marriages, at least Christian leaders have a hard time accepting this in Christian marriages, is that sometimes consequences for sin is permanent. That even grace and forgiveness don't erase consequences. And one of the consequences of repeated deceit and harm in a marriage is permanent broken trust. I'm just going to give you an example that all of you will be able to relate to. At least I hope 100% of you relate to this. If one of your parents or one of your husband's parents sexually molested one of your children and they admitted it and they cried their eyes out, they repented and they went to counseling for help, would you in a million years ever let your child sleep over there again? Yes or no? Put it in the chat. That doesn't mean you don't forgive them. It doesn't mean you don't care about them. It doesn't mean that you don't even still love them, but you don't trust them, nor should you, nor should you. Trust has been permanently broken and you are not gonna take a chance with your little one to ever be in that situation again, right? And so, and so when trust is broken, sometimes it's permanently broken. And I don't think women should be made feel, to feel guilty about that, or even men who, who are in that situation to feel guilty that I don't think I ever can trust you again. I don't know whether you're really sorry because you've lied to me so much and you've told me you've changed so much. I can't ever know whether you're telling the truth. You're a really good liar. Yeah. I can never trust you. And sometimes that's the permanent consequence. If you leave this Facebook Live today and run to the grocery store and you drive stupid, and you're texting when you drive and you kill a kid on a bike, you can be really sorry, you can be really sad, you can be brokenhearted and truly repentant, and that kid is never coming back to life. And so in the Christian life, sometimes we think, oh, well, our marriage can be revived. Some of them can, and some of them can't. And we ought not put a guilt trip on women when they say, I don't think I can ever trust him again. I'm, I'm happy he's repentant, I hope he has a good life, I don't mean ill will toward him, but I don't want to be with him again. I don't want to be in a relationship where I have to feel 
like I have to kiss them or sleep with them or be intimate with someone I don't trust and feel afraid of. That's right. Maybe he's different. Maybe he's not. But the marriage relationship requires certain levels of intimacy that if you don't feel safe and you can't trust someone, it's like being raped over and over again. Mm -hmm. And God isn't asking you to do that. No. No. To me, I always looked at trust because, you know, it's been violated in my marriage, too. And, you know, there were seasons where I did trust again for a variety of reasons. But the biggest of which is that God would would give me the permission to have trust as a decision. It wasn't just it's not a feeling. I mean, some people may argue with me and that's okay. Um, It's a bit semantics, but I looked at it as a decision. And how do you make decisions? You take in information. Right. So that's what I would do. And I do this with anybody. I take in information. Are you on time when you say you're going to be on time? Okay. I can trust that you show up when you say you will. Are you going to be faithful to me? Well, yes. I, you know, if I can see that you're faithful, then I'll trust that you're faithful. If you're not, then I guess maybe I better be a little more weary, right? Weary and weary. Um, but it's, it's information you take in so that you're not powerless over how you trust. You get to decide. As Leslie said er- earlier, we have agency, we have the right to choose. And I think God gave us the ability to reason. And to feel and to think so that we can make those wise decisions. And if we can't for ourselves, then that's why we open ourselves up to wise others that can maybe support us and help us think through some of these difficult um, circumstances. Here's a couple of biblical examples about this. For those of you who are thinking in your mind, well, my pastor says that love always trusts. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 says love always trusts. And I still love him. And so I'm supposed to trust him. I don't know how I can do this because, you know, all of that crazy making conversation. So... Love believes all things, it says, right? That's what it says. Love believes all things. Some of it's been translated as trust, but love always believes all things. So believe it. When he keeps lying to you, believe it. Right? Believe reality. Believe That's how healthy people are courageously committed to truth. Believe it. I can't trust him, right? But let me just, the author of that passage, which is the Apostle Paul, didn't mean that you have to trust everybody because he himself didn't trust everyone. For example, in 1 Timothy, he says to Timothy, hey, Timothy, be careful of Alexander the coppersmith. He did me great harm. Don't trust him. What? Paul says to not trust someone? No, this man is a bad man. Don't trust him, Timothy. Right? He might have forgiven him, but he's warning him. This is not a trustworthy person. And if you recall that Paul had a big fight with Barnabas in Acts, I think, 15, over a young man called John Mark, because they went on the missionary journey together, and John Mark somehow did not keep his promises and wigged out and was unreliable. We don't exactly know the details, but Paul said, done with John Mark. I'm not having anything to do with him. He was broken trust right? Barnabas said, let's give him another chance. Paul said, I'm not giving him another chance. So that's why Paul and Barnabas split ways, if you read the story. Later on, we hear Paul say, bring John Mark with you. He has proven himself reliable. John Mark earned Paul's trust back. So yes, sometimes trust is broken and sometimes it's repaired. Wonderful, wonderful stuff in marriages and relationships. And sometimes trust is broken and the person who broke trust has no interest in repairing it, but somehow feels entitled to you still trusting them when they've robbed you or raped you or done other horrible things to you. And somehow you're supposed to just forgive and trust and you can forgive, but you don't trust. Love calls you to love your enemy. Jesus doesn't tell you to trust your enemy. They're your enemy. You can't trust them. That's why they're your enemy. Mm -hmm. So understand the Bible isn't as black and white on all these things as we have been taught. And that's why, my friend, it's so important for you to think for yourself and read your Bible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. What's the story behind how you select coaches, Leslie? (laughs) I'm not (laughs) sure what you mean. Um, I have a team of coaches that we, that I have selected over a number of years. Jen's been on my team for a number of years. Um, So this is more recent in her life, but I've known her for a number of years. So they have to be a godly believer. They have to have coaching experience and coaching credentials. Uh, They have to understand the model that I teach and destructive marriages and destructive relationships. And then I have to observe them for a while before I I invite them to, to be on my team. So that's the, that's the criteria of being a coach on my team. How I invite them to be on a Facebook Live is I invite my coaches to share the Facebook Live burden with me, not burden, but privilege burden, however you want to put it. <laughs> we have a, a, 
uh, lots of Facebook lives to do and I don't want to do them all by myself. And so I put a list out there and my coaches decide which ones they want to be a part of and then they join with me. So that's how we decide. Nothing complicated. Yeah. And it's a huge blessing. It really is. <laughs> All right, Jen, I'm gonna ask you this question. My husband and I are under a no contact order right now. He didn't harm me physically, but he threw a pair of glasses and the officers had him arrested with no bond. Mm. How do I focus on me and my healing right now? I have a small farm, no children or family here in Florida. I feel like everywhere I look, all of our memories that I made an awful choice by calling the law on him. Mm. So I'm hearing some guilt in there, you know, uh, some regret. I think all of those words can kind of come in there. So I do um, feel for your situation. Absolutely. And I'm sorry to hear that. To focus on your healing, obviously, to, you know, I would say turn it over to God. Absolutely. Especially those conflicted feelings that you have. I mean, obviously you felt like your safety was at risk and you needed to call the police. That was a wise thing to do. And then, then you turn around and you think, oh, why did I do this? Because now you're understanding sort of the consequences and maybe experiencing the loneliness or the what ifs or what's my future hold. And just like it says in Philippians, like, do not be anxious for anything and, and be prayerful throughout this. So I really encourage you that way. I do understand that it feels isolating because you don't have kids or family or friends around. So see what it is that you can do. If you do go to church, find a trusted, as we just talked about, trust, find a trusted, safe person that maybe you can talk to, or it may have to be a paid professional if you're still very um, leery about sharing some of these details and what you're feeling. But in terms of healing, I encourage you to keep going and just take your time. You know, you might want to journal about what it is that you think you need. Maybe, maybe you need some um, understanding around what you're grieving, what you've lost, uh, the situation that maybe he wasn't like this before. Now, all of a sudden, he's turned into this person that would throw a pair of glasses at you or something like that. So there's a lot of grief here, some guilt, um, and, and a real opportunity for you to flourish when you're ready and only when you're ready to be able to expand, enjoy the farm, or um, take on extra activities if it's warranted in your schedule. Um, get to meet new friends, and they don't have to hear all your story. They really don't. You have to, people have to earn the right to hear your story, but you can go out and still make friends and do what it is that you need to do. You know, look at your own morals and values to see what's really important to you so that you can continue to live up to those. And I hear that safety was a big value to you in that moment. You did the best that you could do with what you were thinking and believing at the time. So please honor that. Yeah. And I think this is a wake up call for both you and him, both for you that, that um, maybe you need to build more of a life than just as a wife that you need to have friends, you need a support system, and that's important to you whether you and your husband make your marriage work or not. That's important, so learn from that. And I think it's really important that he does understand the consequences of his behavior. And there are consequences, both in your marriage and also legal consequences. And I know that usually women who call the police are less likely to continue to be hit or harmed in physical ways. That doesn't mean the abuse stops. It usually becomes more covert. So don't think that everything's going to be better if you know he gets arrested. But it is an opportunity for him to say, wow, I'm in charge of my temper. And I'm going to use this question to answer the next question because somebody said, what if the husband believes his problems are 100% the wife? Mm -hmm. I'm going to unpack this a lot in the workshop because a lot of husbands absolutely believe that if you just would talk nice to me, I wouldn't have hit you. If you just stopped, you know, complaining, I wouldn't, you know, curse at you, you know, whatever. If you just had sex with me upside down four times a day, I wouldn't be watching porn. Exactly. It's all of your fault that I do what I do. So this is the same chart that we used before. So, and we'll use this in the workshop quite a bit. So if you haven't signed up for the workshop, please sign up for the workshop. I don't have an eraser in front of me, but if we, if we just use this chart, we'll use it in the, and we'll use it in the workshop a lot. But he says, everything that I do, everything that happens to me out here, like I get frustrated, I get angry, I get lonely, I get sexually turned on, right? It has nothing to do with me. It has something to do with, well, the environment, or she tempted me, or you angered me, or whatever. So he's saying that my external world has to be perfect in order for me to behave. Well, how possible is that? But we buy it as Christian women because maybe we did 
do something like maybe we didn't have sex for a couple of weeks because we were sick or the kids, we just had a new baby or whatever. And so we take it on us. Oh, it was my fault that he acted out. Or maybe we did have a critical remark or we weren't as nice as we could have been or we bugged him about something too many times and then he lost his temper and said, it's our fault. But let me just say this really clearly. And again, I will unpack this at the workshop a lot. But if he needs you to be perfect in order for him to be okay, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> you cannot be perfect. You can't. And this is the burden that Christian, quit pushing his buttons. You're triggering him. If only you had more sex. Like if only we were the perfect wife, he wouldn't have any of these problems. It's a lie. It's a lie. First of all, you can't be the perfect wife. And second of all, there is no perfect life that he is never going to be bothered by anything. And so it might be that he needs to learn to manage his emotions, his anger, his lust, his selfishness, his greed, his temptations. That's what the Bible teaches us, that those are real things in everyone's life. And we, as we mature, have to learn to manage them. It's not, it's not your job to manage my temper. You might do things that make me feel angry, for sure. But if I feel angry, whose job is it to manage that, yours or mine? It's mine. How many of you, your children have made you very angry, angry enough to whack them upside the head a couple times? I hope you don't do that because you manage your temper. It's not your children's fault if you lose your temper. They provoke your temper for sure, mm -hmm. right? But they don't make you hit them. You control your hands. You control your mouth. And so does your husband. Do not let him blame you. He might think that way. Just don't buy it. It's not true. Yeah. That's right. And I always say a little tongue in cheek, I will admit, but we're just not that powerful. And if we were that powerful to make them do something then, or make them feel a certain thing, then I think I would use those, those powers for good and not for evil. Right. So mm -hmm. whenever someone tries to accuse you or you made me do this, or I'm not that powerful. I'm sorry. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really not. So, and I did see, okay. So Karen answered it. I did see a question in there about cost again. And, and you'd already mentioned that this is just your blessing to our audience. It's, it's mm -hmm. free for an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, however long we're on there <laughs> or next week. So yeah. yeah. And the best thing about next week, real quickly, we're going to go now because Instagram shuts us off in an hour. So we want to be respectful for those of you who join Instagram. We'll be back on tomorrow morning um, at noon Eastern time. And I think our topic is um, boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Help, so that'll healthy follow boundaries, art of empowerment, not control. Okay. So that'll be in line with some of the questions that we haven't gotten a chance to answer for that. So noon tomorrow, we'll do the same thing. We'll come back on, but our webinar next week, please sign up for it because it is going to be about an hour long, but it's much more organized. It's very succinct. You will get the handouts. You will get the workbook to, to take the notes. You will see PowerPoints on there. So they'll, you can take pictures of the PowerPoint. So it'll be very succinct teaching on these topics. And then afterwards we stay, I will stay with two of my coaches. We will do as long of a Q&A as you need. So we won't be bound by time and it's completely off of social media. So you don't have to worry about confidentiality or privacy or anybody seeing you on there other than other people who are on the workshop. So you have to sign up though to get the link. So please sign up. It's lesliebernick.com forward slash join webinar, all one word, join webinar. Yeah. All right. So we will see you tomorrow at noon Eastern time, same time, same place, talking about how does boundaries, you don't control him. You can't control him with boundaries, but you can control what you put up with and what you do and what you don't do. So stay tuned tomorrow. Some of the questions that are here, we'll have to do with that tomorrow. We'll keep them on our tracker so we can answer them for you tomorrow. All right. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.